The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. In an historically unsettled political environment, the turmoil seems to be mounting as we plunge toward the November 6th national and statewide election. We survey the landscape with our own political expert, Melissa Michelson from Menlo College is here. The game is politics and so much more. The game is on. Welcome to the game. I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Just when you think it can't get any crazier, it does. We follow politics and government for a living because we have been fascinated and even inspired by it. But this year or month or week leaves us all wondering what will happen next. How will the uncertainty and chaos play out and whether we will be left with a massive rebuilding project? This we know for sure, an election is just a few weeks away. And so we're happy to have back our friend and political insider, Melissa Michelson, professor of political science at Menlo College, for her insights on what has happened and her best guess about what may happen on November 6th. Welcome, we're glad to have you here again, as, as always. And, and also, you've already agreed to be on our live election night show, so thank we're you. Miss it. We're gonna keep you here until the cows come home or until the votes are all counted. <laughs> um, Although with the mail in, it takes several weeks. Right. I'm, how much will <laughs> so we bring a change of clothes? <laughs> anyway, let's get down to the actual topic of the show, which starts with the Supreme Court. As we're taping this, the vote, uh, the, the the debate has begun on on whether or not to uh, confirm uh, Judge Kavanaugh. By the time this airs, they will have already decided. Uh, I think we can mostly decide. My my best guess is that they're going to go ahead and confirm him. But in either case, a, as a political scientist putting aside whether Kavanaugh's confirmed or not, what has all this done to the reputation of uh, the Senate, of Congress, and of the Supreme Court? I don't know how much it's really changed attitudes about the Senate. I think people expect the extreme partisanship in the Senate that we've seen, and they expect that from elected representatives who have run as Democrats and as Republicans. I think what is gonna change, though, is perceptions of the Supreme Court. I don't think we've seen this kind of negative publicity for the court or this kind of um, images about partisanship on the court since Bush v. Gore in 2000. So when the decision was made by the court to end the recount and give the presidency to Bush in 2000, a lot of folks were worried about how that would damage the reputation of the court, how that made it seem that justices were deciding based on their partisanship. Now. He's saying that he's a partisan, right? He's, Judge Kavanaugh said during his hearing, this is revenge for the Clintons. This is, this is a partisan attack. And to have somebody bring up partisanship like that, relating it to the Supreme Court, that's different. And I, and I want to be clear, I think the Supreme Court has been a partisan institution for some time. It was just kind of not behind overtly, the scenes. Perhaps. Exactly, it was, oh, it was not overt. It was behind the scenes. It was. It was, it was hushed and it was hinted at, and now it's right out there, right? The, the veil of secrecy has been lifted. The, all, of, you know, all of that is out the window now, and now it's just, this is the Republican guy. This is a Republican decision. He's gonna make Republican decisions. And I think that really hurts public attitudes about the court. Looking beyond that question and looking beyond the immediate decision about whether or not he's seated, the whole spectacle of, of Dr. Blasey Ford and Judge Kavanaugh sort of pitted against each other. What, what has that done to the general political environment? It was already divided. Has it sharpened that division? Has it, has it deepened those divisions? It does seem like it's deepening the divisions and maybe activating more people to not only come forward with their own stories of, of harassment and rape, but getting more of them interested in politics. So uh, the big political scientist word is uh, politicization, that people have been politicized by this event. And so I think it means that more women, maybe people who didn't care about politics much before, didn't vote, now those folks have been politicized by this 
uh, confirmation battle, and now they're going to be more likely to vote. And do you believe that's mostly on the left, on the progressive side, in reaction to uh, what appears to be uh, a Kavanaugh nomination that will move forward and, and uh, placement on the court? Will that action really be on the left, or is it sort of across the political spectrum you have an active, uh, activated uh, electorate? I think this issue is going to activate the left more than the right. If you're wrong and if he's not confirmed, if Kavanaugh is not confirmed, I think that might activate the right, right? Because now they'll feel like their party was, um, was attacked by, um, by the Democrats and that they have to fight for their team, for their party. And so I think if Kavanaugh is not confirmed, you'll get a politicization of folks on the right. But I think the issue itself is part of the Me Too movement, which is very much a, a progressive, a democratic electorate yeah. being activated. I want to get into that in a second, but let me ask you first. It, it seems as though we had, we have increasingly hardened lines that, that, okay, they play the game this way. Our only answer is to do the same on the other side. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, we're really in an era of extreme polarization, extreme um, political identities. There's been a, a lot said about this uh, recently, uh, some really good books written by political scientists about it. But the idea is that it used to be that you could know a lot of things about a person in previous time periods and not necessarily know for sure if they were a Republican or a Democrat. All of their identities didn't line up. And so you had more bipartisanship, you had more compromise because people might be on one side on this issue, one side the other issue. Now it's all lined up. Now all of your identities match up, your religion, your partisanship, your, your racial identity. And so now th those battle lines are so much more severe. Now you get um, more extreme battles and, and just more digging in and wanting to win at all costs. Mm -hmm. So we have these two tribes, the, the red and the blue, but it's yeah. also coming at a time where we're seeing some numbers in California, for example, where people are moving away from the political parties. Uh, the, the growing segment of the electorate is, is uh, no party preference, those yeah. who uh, declare themselves as independent. So it's an interesting dynamic. You have a hardening on the left and the right into these sort of, these sort of tribes, if you will, but you also have a, a significant segment of the electorate that's not aligned with, with, with either party. And, and that may be a California phenomenon cutting against the grain uh, with the national. But what is your, what is your view on um, that, that dynamic? My impression of the rising number of, the rising proportion of decline to states is, is kind of two things. I think one of them is as the political parties have really divided more severely, folks who maybe are questioning their previous political affiliation don't always feel comfortable jumping across that chasm. So decline to state is like a safe middle position, right? And so I think for some people, the party they grew up with is no longer a party they feel comfortable with, but they're not ready to go to the other team, right? And so nicely, California provides this option of decline to state. I think the other thing is that we've created uh, incentives in our electoral system to identify as declined to state. You don't need to identify as a party anymore. You can still participate in the primary. There, you then get- so There's no punishment, there's no disincentive. There's no disincentive. So whereas previously and in other states, we force people to choose. If they want to have a voice here, we don't make them do that. It, but is that a re, sort of the essence of Kevin's question? Is that a rejection of the extremes also? I mean, yeah, we, there's a place you can go, but the party I was affiliated with is no longer the party I want to be affiliated with. Is that a rejection of the extremes or is it just a, a safe parking spot? Uh, I think that probably de that depends, right? I think for some people it's a rejection of the extremes, but I think if people are so put off by politics, they're gonna be more inclined to just stop participating. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a way it, it, it's, it's them coming to terms with how the parties have realigned and have, and have become more extreme, and it's a way for them to stay involved in politics. Mm -hmm. Right. We're, so I think we're going to stop you there. Okay, we're stop sorry. You there. You can finish that thought in a second. <laughs> I have thoughts. That's okay. You can have you can have a minute or two to think about it. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back.
It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. And over here, uh, Melissa Michelson from Menlo College, our political expert. Uh, you had a thought. I don't know if you recall what it was, but we were talking we about... We were talking about a lot of stuff over the... Well, let's move on to something so, else, because okay. one of the things you did mention is you think that the Me Too movement tends to skew left. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess they're for democratic. Um, but the fact is... You know, on behalf of your entire gender, how are women in America feeling? Um, <laughs> I think in more, in more fairness, as a political scientist, you know better than I do, there isn't such a thing as a women's vote. It doesn't move en masse in one direction or another. I think a lot of people are counting on something like that happening because a lot of women are angry about how things have unfolded in the last year, two years with the Me Too movement and then culminating with the, the Balazi Ford testimony. So what's your take on all of that? Yeah. Well, there is definitely a gender gap. Democrats, uh, women have tended to favor the Democratic Party, but it's been a pretty narrow gap. And that gender gap is growing, but it's, by, it's split up by race. And whereas women of color are definitely much more strongly aligned with the Democratic Party, white women aren't, right? White women supported Trump. And I think it's because Identity as a woman, speaking for my gender, right? Identity as a woman, seriously though, um, is not as strong of an identity. It doesn't motivate people in the same way. Women don't feel like what happens to other women necessarily affects me the same way that people who are black think what happens to other black people also affects me. There's not that same sort of idea of linked fate and being a cohesive group. And so for women, even if you think being a woman is an important part of your identity, you don't feel so much like you're this big group whose fate rests together and so it doesn't motivate you politically as much. It's not a political identity. Yeah. So. I think we're on the precipice here of a year of the woman and probably extends to 2020 as well. Just the number of women running for Congress, for example. I mean, there clearly is something happening. The energy level that manifests not only in increased uh, voter registrations, but also just putting yourself on the ballot, which, which uh, takes some courage in and of itself. Um, so it, clearly, just, just based on the number of female candidates, we're going to have more women elected to Congress, uh, hopefully more elected to the legislature where there really is a gender imbalance. But uh, talk about that dynamic of, of women actually getting elected in 2018 and 2020. Yeah, it's, it's like the second year of the woman, right? Because we had one in 1992, just after the Clarence Thomas hearings. So there's a lot of interesting historical parallels there. I do think we'll get more women elected because a lot of research has shown that when women run, they are just as likely to win. And so the gap that we see in terms of less representation of women is more about women not running. So now that they're running, we will see more women elected and, and that's huge, right? Um, we're, we'll get more women on these important committees. We'll get more women uh, making decisions about about justices and, and other laws. So it's it's a good thing to have women more strongly represented. Um, most of those women, though, that are running, they're running as Democrats. And so I think it's an open question for the Republican Party what what they're going to do um, in the face of this year of the woman. Are they, maybe they're gonna to have to work a little bit harder to recruit women to run as members of their party because otherwise maybe gender will become a stronger political identity if the Republicans can't keep up with that trend. Let's talk about um, the 2018 election. One of the, one of the realities of um, the last presidential race is a lot of people didn't show up uh, and, and it probably changed the outcome not showing up. Uh, is it your sense that there's an energized electorate out there that's sort of eager. We had uh, a report just this week. There's record levels of registration 
in California? Record levels of registration, record levels of people saying they are intending to vote, that they are excited to vote, and record levels of turnout in primaries and in special elections. And so all indications, both in terms of public opinion and political behavior, we're seeing increased amounts of energy. And I would note that, that that's particularly true among Democrats. Right? When we've had these special elections and these primary elections, it's Democrats who are even more excited to turn out, I think because they are unsatisfied, unhappy with the outcome of the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. And when people are angry, uh, when they want to see a change, they're more likely to participate. When people are happy with how things are going, when they don't have any complaints, less excited mm -hmm. to vote. Yeah, so the uh, 2020 cycle in particular uh, will be crucial for the redistricting process that will happen, uh, which will potentially determine control of Congress for the, the following uh, decade. We in California have the California Citizens uh, Commission that draws our districts, regardless of uh, political uh, influence that's been taken away from the legislature and, and rests with a, with a citizen's body. Um, just talk about how important these state level races are across the country, governor and state legislatures, as we come up on the turn of the decade and the census is done and that redistricting, the reapportionment process happens. I mean, that is one of those really kind of niche political science things, but in reality, it's very much at the core of who's going to control politics for the, for the following decade in, in many respects. Is that yeah. Correct? Well, you didn't mention it, but really what I'm thinking about when I think about the 2020 census is the immigration question that's in there right now. Right. And I think a, an open question and one in which I'm actually working with some community organizations to answer right now is how can we ensure that California gets an accurate count mm -hmm. given the diversity of our communities and and the, the presence of people with different immigration statuses, how can we make sure that everybody answers the census so that when those lines are redrawn by the Citizens Redistricting Commission, they actually do reflect the real population of California and not the subset of folks who were willing to answer the census even with this question on it that they're worried about answering. And so, yeah, 2020 is gonna be a huge year in many ways, but I think what in terms of the redistricting question, we got to keep an eye on making sure either that that question gets removed because I do think it's going to have a, uh, an effect on people. The, the question you're referring to is asking if you're an immigrant? It's asking about the different members of your household and asking about their immigration status. status. Yeah. And so the fear is that, you know, a lot of folks have mixed status households. There are members of their households who are here without documents on expired visas or whatever situation, right? We have a lot of AB 540 people, if we're talking about college students, we have a lot of undocumented folks. Right. And so if you're in a household and you're filling out the form and you get to that, what do you do? Yeah. Right? Do you lie on the census form? Do you, do you just not return the census yeah, form? Opt out. Because now you're worried that despite you know, reassurances, they're gonna share that information with the Department of Homeland Security and then ICE is gonna be at the door. Yeah. We're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna wait for ICE to knock down this door, but meanwhile, stick around, we'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen, and over here we have Melissa Michelson, Menlo College political science professor, um, and uh, also going to be one of our guests on our live election night show, which you should come and watch if you want to know what's going on around here. Let's talk about what's going on. What's your best guess based on what you've been le reading about with, with uh, the Senate races and the con congressional races? Do the Democrats take back one or both of the houses, or is that still, I mean, things like this Kavanaugh hearing can change the whole dynamic overnight. Absolutely. And I think what happens with the Kavanaugh vote between when we're taping this and when people get to watch it is definitely going to affect turnout and could affect the Senate elections. But I don't think it changes what happens in the House. I think 
okay, I should be careful because I predicted things a couple of years ago and that all turned out horribly We still wrong. have the tape, by the way, so we'll we're actually going to air it on election night, yeah. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but if the polls are accurate, if, right, it does look very much like Democrats will take back the House. That seems uh, pretty sure, pretty certain. Whether Democrats can take back the Senate, probably, you know, probably not. It was a tough map. A lot of Democrats in tough states, uh, like Heidi Heitkamp, defending their seats in, in very red states. Uh, New Jersey, uh, Republic, uh, Democratic senator, uh, not helping. Um, so it looks like Republicans will retain control of the Senate. Is it, um, and what does that mean? <laughs> well, I mean, is, so, it, it, looks so like sort of, it looks like we're sort of flopping from one to a, you know one extreme to another. Uh, is some of that just the nature of uh, of American history that we do sort of swing? Well, it's a reflection of turnout, right? Because you get different people turning out in midterm elections and in than in presidential elections. If we had better, more consistent turnout in this country, we wouldn't get those wild swings because it would be the same people showing up every time. Mm -hmm. Um, but what it also means is that if Democrats control the House, we will see a change in what is happening in Congress because you can't pass laws without both chambers. The House is a very hierarchical institution, unlike the Senate. So whoever is the new speaker, whether it's Pelosi or somebody else, they would be able to control that chamber. They'd be able to block legislation. They'd be able to hold hearings. They'd be able to impeach folks. You know, whether or not they're removed, that's a whole other question, but they could bring articles of impeachment. Uh, so I think it would change things quite a bit. So Democrats have been careful around this impeachment issue, the I word. Um, what do you think will happen? Will there be such pressure among the base to push for an impeachment? Or do you think it's something short of that where investigations are done, subpoenas issued, a furtherance of investigation of the administration and ties to Russia and other uh, assorted issues, maybe related to the president's tax returns, or do you think there's going to be such political pressure from the grassroots that impeachment is almost uh, inevitable? Wow, that's a really hard question, and it's also funny because a lot what I've seen the last past couple of days is folks talking about whether or not Kavanaugh should be impeached after he's approved, and regardless of whether he'd be removed, whether it's Kavanaugh who should be impeached. I think probably they would start with hearings. They'd wait for the Mueller investigation to wrap up. I think there would be a lot more oversight and a lot more hearings. And I think they would be cautious in terms of pushing for impeachment of the president because in the past that has been seen as a very political game and that, that has right. gone badly. It went badly for the Republicans when they tried to impeach Clinton. And so I think unless they feel like there's a possibility that it would be confirmed by the Senate, you know, whether the country really was at that point where maybe we were with Nixon, if he hadn't stepped down, I think Nixon would have been removed from office. I think unless, it can't just be the very strong Democrats. It can't just be a half of the country. It needs to be that a strong majority of the country feels like the president needs to be removed, I think, before Democrats would really push for that. Yeah, it can't be perceived that we just don't like him. Exactly. Yeah. It can't be perceived as partisan. Yeah. It has to be perceived as protecting the country. Well, and I don't think we're there yet at all. Let me talk uh, quickly about uh, a couple of local things that are going on that could really affect the election and make for an interesting election night. One is uh, balloting by mail. The mail, the ballots are out uh, as of the, the airing of this show. The, in San Mateo County, the, the vote by mail ballots have arrived or have been sent out. And then also we're seeing increasing cities going to city council elections by district. What are the dynamics, what are the impacts of those two things in terms of who gets elected, who chooses to run, who wins? Yeah, well I think vote by mail is really important because it means that folks have more time to Google their answers basically, right? If you are participating at a polling place, unless you've prepared, sometimes you get towards you know page two, page three, and you're like, oh, I didn't even know this contest was on the ballot. I don't even know anything about this proposition and you're more likely to skip it. And so moving to vote by mail, I think, increases ballot completion and decreases runoff. And so folks who are running in city council, water district, all these you know, more minor offices, these local propositions, folks get to that and they go, oh, well, let me go on the internet. Let me research that. And so I think that's good. It means that we're going to have a more representative electorate on all those down ballot contests. 
What I think is happening with these city council races moving to district, I think that's very good for diversity. And of course, that's why uh, the Lawyers Commission on Civil Rights has been pushing for cities and counties to move to district elections. You know, there's pros and cons of district versus at large, but what it does do is, is increase diversity. It allows for women and people of color to get elected and to have voices on those elected bodies, and I think that's good for those communities. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time, so um, I unless we've got I was nothing. I trying to talk really fast. No, you did good, too. <laughs> uh, Melissa Michelson, thank you so much for being here again. We always enjoy having you here. Thanks. And uh, thank you for agreeing to appear on our show. We'll be live starting at 8 o'clock on election night. Kevin and I will be here to bring you all the local results and everything you want to know. We'll also spend a fair amount of time on what's happening nationally because people in this area care so passionately. Melissa Michelson, thank you once again. I'm Mark Simon. And I'm Kevin Mullen. Thanks for being with us. And join us next time in on election night here on The Game.